hearings uh, come into order. <coughs> Good morning, I'm Peter Ku, Chair of the Committee on Parks and Recreation, and I would like to welcome all of you to this hearing, which will examine <coughs> how we can improve the efficiency of the park capital project process. I'd like to thank my fellow co-chairs, Council Member Vanessa Gibson and Council Member Ben Kalos for agreeing to hold this joint oversight hearing. The road to competing a park's capital project is typically long and complex. It begins with the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, approving of a funded project. Then a meeting will occur with various stakeholders to develop the overall design of the project. Once the scope of the project has been established, the design must typically be approved by the Public Design Commission, PDC, and sometimes the Landmark Preservation Commission, LPC. Often, PDC will disapprove of a project and send it back to be redesigned or corrected. Once the design is fully approved, the project may proceed to the remaining phases, procurement, construction, final inspection, and close out. Throughout this process, DPR's Capital Projects Division is responsible for overseeing all aspects of the project and bringing it to its completion. <clears throat> the amount of projects under Park's portfolio is so vast. We, for example, in fiscal 2020, the agency has 619 active projects, estimated to cost about $2.7 billion. These numbers have been steadily increasing since fiscal year 2016. However, this process has traditionally been faced with delays, cost overruns, and the lack of communication between parks and funders or capital projects, and concerns have historically been raised regarding parks project planning process. The ongoing delays, cost overruns, and past method for prioritizing funded projects. I will offer you one example of one of the more typical problems that I know many of my colleagues have dealt with regarding the capital projects that they have funded. In fiscal year 2016, I partnered with Queensboro President Melinda Cash to fund renovations at Maple Playground in my district. There was an initial funding shortfall so two years later, in February 2018, we added more funding based on the estimate that PASS gave us in order, to fund, in order to fully fund the project. Just two months after receiving that quote, and right after the capital process had wrapped for the year, we were told that even more money was needed. In short, the project design phase just finally commenced this past May, three years later, three years after it was thought to have been fully funded. This inability to accurately estimate the cost of projects is incredibly frustrating, to say the least. But sadly, one of the more common reasons why projects are faced with delays even after we are after even after we are lead to believe that they are fully funded. It is my hope that these shocks, this kind of issues can be resolved if we work together to improve the process. To his credit, past department under Commissioner Silver has recognized that the process needs to be improved and has already implemented numerous reforms. In fiscal 2019, PASS 
completed construction on 162 projects <coughs> in which 86% were completed on time and 90% were within budget. This compares favorably with earlier fiscal years where the on-time and in-budget percentages averaged from low 70s to mid 80s. Those, involved, those improved numbers may be due to some of the reforms implemented by parks, including more baseline funding for more capital division staffers, funding for full capital needs assessment that will provide parks with a more comprehensive understanding of the needs of the park system, establishing a pre-qualified list of contractors for projects under $3 million, a reduction in the average time for design by 54 days, an increase in the time that the project designs were being approved by the PDC, a rate of 83% as opposed to only 20% in prior years. A reduction in the number of change orders for projects by 78%. Holding more early stakeholders meetings in the PE design phase. Streamlining the internal review meetings during the design phase from five to two meetings and using more standard designs for items such as comfort stations. While the efforts to improve the process is commendable, more needs to be done. Many have agreed that such reforms should include the following. The city should provide parks with its own discretionary capital budget to enable it to better plan and budget for capital projects over the long run. The lack of a discretionary budget, unlike other agencies performing, performing capital work, prevents parks from addressing capital needs quickly. Parks should increase the use of standardized design templates to improve the speed of design phase. The customization of every, pro, uh, every capital project unnecessarily slows down the process. Parts should increase the technical assistance it provides to, it, to its vendors and work on standardizing invoice re review and approval process. The city should look at funding for in-house construction crews for parks projects so that more projects can be done outside of the bidding projects. Parts should expand its PE qualified list of contractors as it will limit the bidding universe to vendors who are more likely capable of competing the bid efficiently. And parks should apply design build principles <coughs> to a large number of park projects. I look forward to examine these issues in more detail so we can inform what needs to be done in order to ensure that capital projects are completed quickly, safely, and, uh, and at a reasonable cost to the city taxpayers. I'd like to welcome the administration and the advocates and the advocates who have come today to testify. Thank you. Now I'd like to uh, ask uh, Vanessa Gibson to give, his, to give her opening. Thank you so much to uh, Chair Peter Koo. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I am New York City Council Member Vanessa Gibson. I am proud to represent District 16 in the Borough of the Bronx, and I am proud to serve as Chair of the Subcommittee on the Capital Budget, and I thank all of you for being here today, as well as my co-chairs, our Chair of the Committee on Parks and Recreation, uh, Chair Peter Koo, and our Chair of the Committee on Contracts, Chair Ben Kalos. Um, I thank the Parks Department for being here today on this very important hearing to discuss improving the efficiency 
of Parks Department capital projects, a topic that we all love. Uh, the Department of Parks and Recreation is an important part of our city's capital program. It exceeds $4 billion from fiscal year 2020 through fiscal year 2023, which is more than 5% of the city's overall adopted capital commitment plan. This fiscal year, Parks is working currently on 619 capital projects in all five boroughs. These range from large undertakings and capital projects like finishing the build out of the Hudson River Park along the west side of Manhattan to smaller projects in my district that I'm very proud of, Plimpton Playground reconstruction in our community. And on many smaller parks projects, the council often partners with the administration and allocates discretionary capital dollars to fund many of these projects. Every one of these parks are important to our constituents and their families, which makes them very important to all of us here in the City Council. This morning's hearing is going to focus on ways to improve the efficiency of Parks Capital Project delivery. We know that this has been an important focus for our Commissioner, Mitchell Silver, and his team, and we want to give credit where it's essentially due. More projects are happening year to year and faster than before. Progress has been made. We can even track the progress of our parks projects in real time online with the parks capital tracker, which we're very happy about. Um, however, while we've made incredible progress, we know that there is much work that needs to be done. And many of us, including I'm sure the administration and my fellow colleagues have been frustrated about the many steps that were necessary to deliver parks projects on time from design to procurement to overall construction and my favorite part, ribbon cutting. There are dozens of consultations, reviews, and approvals during this process which have to happen, any of which can become a source of delay. We recognize that. We hope that today we can identify even more strategies that will be put forth for further accelerating project delivery and improving project transparency. We all together need to figure out how the City Council and the administration can continue working together to streamline the process, increase efficiency, whether by negotiating for an increase in budgets as well as headcount, which we're very happy in the adopted budget we focused on more park staff, which we're very grateful for, and PEP officers, um, including changing some of our local laws, looking at legislative um, introductions, or lobbying for changes in our state law. Um, we thank you, Commissioner Silva, for being here, and I want to acknowledge the staff of the subcommittee on capital budget that works so hard every every day to make the subcommittee um, obviously a, an equal partner with the council and the administration our senior counsel Rebecca Chasen our assistant counsel Noah Brick our unit head Chima Obi chair our financial analyst Monica Bujak and I also want to recognize the members of the subcommittee on capital uh, minority leader Steve Matteo council member Barry Gradenchik and we also have council Council members Adrian Adams, Council member Justin Brannan, Council member Joe Borelli, Council member Big Bill Perkins, Council member Andy Cohen, Council member Ruben Diaz Sr. and Okay, and we'll be joined by other council members as well. Um, and with that, I just want to thank you again, Commissioner Silva. You and I, uh, along with the Bronx Borough Parks Commissioner, who I always want to acknowledge, Iris Rodriguez Rosa, has been phenomenal for us in the Bronx. We have opened so many parks. We have broken ground on many through the CPI initiative, like Little Claremont Park. We've, we've incorporated additional amenities in many of our parks that were not always the case. So it's not just the playground equipment and bathrooms basketball equipment, it's also fitness equipment, mini soccer fields for our growing communities that love soccer, and I appreciate your partnership. And I know that while things are never perfect, we always strive to work to improve the system. And also certainly uh, the topic of comfort stations always comes up, and the never-ending cost of why comfort stations exceed $4, $4 million and what we can do overall to change that so that every park that we have across the city of New York, we should try to incorporate comfort stations as best we can. It shouldn't be a luxury, it really should be an amenity. And many of us council members, we often, you know, 
have events around parks where we have a comfort station because my seniors and my families with small children, they just need that access. And so I look forward to our continued work and our partnership around capital and the overall commitment rate and the commitment plan for the Parks Department and look forward to our continued work. I thank you, Chair Kalos and Chair Ku, and now I'll turn it over to our Chair of the Committee on Contracts, Chair Ben Kalos. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Vanessa Gibson and uh, Chair Ku uh, for holding this uh, joint hearing. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Councilmember Barron, who's just joined us. Also like to acknowledge, uh, re-acknowledge uh, my uh, colleagues from Staten Island, the great borough for as long as it remains a borough. Uh, to the extent they may be successful, uh, Council Members Matteo and Borelli, I will continue to acknowledge them until we, we lose them to, to their desire to secede. Uh, I'm Council Member Ben Kalos. I'm Chair of the City's Council's Committee on Contracts. Uh, for those of you who are watching at home or via live stream, please feel free to participate in this hearing by tweeting at Ben Kalos. Uh, we're also joined by uh, the fourth estate. We've got Rich Calder from The Post and Yoav Gonan from The City. Uh, anyone who's watching and people from the uh, media, feel free to email contracts at Ben Kalos with any questions and we're happy to pass them along. Uh, Chairs Kuhn and Gibson have already given an overview of the Parks Department Capital Division and its $3 billion portfolio and I'd like to re reiterate the efficiency of the uh, Parks Department capital projects. Uh, for me, it is more personal than it has ever been before. I'm, I'm crammed in a one bedroom with my wife and a 21 month old daughter. And the days we do not get to a park are the days that, oh my God, what happened to our house? Uh, she will literally bounce off the walls and tear the house apart. And I, I, every, whether it's raining, snowing, or ridiculously cold, we are out in our city's parks uh, with every other family with small children. And uh, it is when these parks are in bad condition that we generally hear about it, or even worse yet, somehow, uh, worse than a park in, worse con in bad condition is a park that is closed for construction. Uh, I think one of the things we've been working with my constituency around is that it does take construction to get a new park uh, in. Uh, but uh, that being the case, uh, when you have 168,000 people on the Upper East Side, where we are the fourth from the last in terms of open space per person, per capita, we just do not have this park, park space. And uh, oftentimes kids are waiting in line to use equipment and at least in the 80s, we've got one park. It's Carl Scherz Park Playground. Uh, that's currently under construction. And uh, we're, it's a 12 month timeline and we're, uh, we, we, I, I will want the date for our monthly call in because we do need to keep that on track because God knows my child needs a place to play as do every single parent that I'm hearing from every single day. A recent report from the Center for Urban Future found that most projects take 29 to 45 months from approval to ribbon cutting, an amount of time which is just far too long. I only serve for 96 months, and you're talking about an entire term just to get one park done. Additionally, a recent city controller audit highlighted DPR's poor oversight record over construction management firms that it employs. In the audit, a mere 39% of projects run by construction management firms were completed on time, resulting in cost overruns of $4.9 million in fees for the department from 2010 to 2016. The controller credited permit delays, incomplete records, and flawed initial designs with these delays and ultimately determined that a park's inadequate oversight and monitoring that permitted these delays and resulting cost overruns to occur. Accountability is key when dealing with capital projects of this magnitude and up until recently has been severely lacking at parks. While we on the committee commend the recent reforms made by Commissioner Silver and his team, much remains to be done to get parks capital process back on track. Parks needs to continue implementing new streamlining measures, including standardizing uh, to the extent it's possible to standardize designs, I, I, I will just, I, I know speed is important, but what we've seen in my district is 
we take a very long time on design and then we get exactly the same park we had before uh, with none of the new cool equipment that we see in some of the conservancy parks on the west side which has caused a lot of envy and has created situations where parents are actually trekking across town to go to the newer, nicer conservancy playgrounds and I think that our parks department can do just as well if not better. Uh, we can also expand pre-qualified contractor lists to increase competitions and use design build whenever possible. Additionally, while we are assured parks will today highlight the measure it has taken to expand contracting, I, I would like to highlight the issue of a minority and women owned business, MWBE, uh, via your expense contracts. We'd like to know what data is available regarding MWB contracting on parks capital projects so we can garner more complete overall pictures of parks progress towards meeting the mayor's stated goal of 30% MWBE procurement uh, by way of uh, some, I'm just gonna give four examples from my district. Uh, the first one starts uh, when I was eight years old in 1989, the Sutton Place Park uh, was supposed to be returned to the city of New York. It was not returned until 2011, uh, long before it even started running for city council. It was approved by the Public Design Commission in 2013 Work didn't even start until 2017, and uh, it's, uh, in 2019 it was open to the public, but it has not been deemed complete enough for a ribbon cutting. Uh, so, so there is an example of a uh, parks project that actually took almost as long as I've been alive. Uh, another example is Andrew Haswell Green. It was funded in 2008 when I was Chief of Staff to then Assemblymember Jonathan Bing. I was there for the groundbreaking. And uh, fast forward to <laughs> almost 10 years and uh, to the uh, winter of uh, 2017, uh, right after I had been reelected, uh, this project didn't get done during Assemblyman Bing's term. It didn't get done uh, during, it, it got done in the, when I had one month left in my first term, uh, almost 10 years later, uh, and much of my career had already gone by. Uh, another example is uh, John Finley Walk. Uh, it's 452 feet long ramp in my district. Uh, we started with fun fully funded in 2015. It was improved by Public Design Commission in 2015. It was supposed to take 18 months. Uh, it didn't get done until after I was reelected in 2017, and I will tell you, every day I went to that park, constituents put up signs saying, vote against Ben Kalos because this ramp still hasn't been done. Uh, and I want to thank the parks for finally getting it done in 2017. It almost took until 2018. And I know that the commissioner and many parks employees almost got frostbite, uh, but this is another example. My last example is uh, when I got elected, I inherited a report that said that the parks uh, esplanade in my district running from the 50s to the 100s uh, needed over $100 million in work. We secured, and in order to stop it from falling into the river. That's literally what the report said. I came and I uh, said we needed to do something about it. And we secured $35 million to get it done. And then it literally, fell into the river in 2017 while I was running for re-election. Uh, it was something that my opponents took incredible delight in. We actually broke ground that summer. We were able to finally move that capital dollars, but it literally took my entire first term. And then it was supposed to be done 18 months later in 2018. That project still isn't done. Literally, the, the, it is still ongoing uh, years later, and uh, I think we're looking at a, a projected completion date in winter 2020, and the problem is we've asked, and we don't know if winter 2020 means January or February or November, December, uh, so I think these are all some of the concerns that we've been dealing with on an ongoing basis. Uh, I'd like to thank our contracts committee staff, legislative counsel Alex Polinoff, policy analyst Casey Addison, uh, finance unit head John Russell, as well as my chief of staff Jesse Townsend, legislative director Wilfredo Lopez, for all their hard work putting this hearing together. Uh, we've uh, been joined by council members Rivera, Levine, Moya, and Yeager, and I'd like to now uh, 
turn it over to the committee council to swear in the uh, Parks Department. Uh, con uh, the council would swear in administration. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before these committees today? I do. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, you may begin. Yeah. Good morning, Chair Ku and members of the Parks Committee, Chair Kalos and members of the Contracts Committee, and Chair Gibson, members of the Subcommittee on Capital Budget, and other members of the City Council. I am Mitchell Silver, Commissioner of the Department of Parks and Recreation, and I'm joined here today by Deputy Commissioner for Capital Projects, Therese Braddock. Roughly two and a half weeks ago, at a ribbon cutting on Lafayette Playground in Brooklyn, we announced the completion of the 648 capital projects since I became Parks Commissioner in 2014. This is a number and a culmination of year-over-year -year increase in completed capital projects since FY15. That includes roughly 130 delayed projects from my time in parks, nearly all of which are now completed or in construction. The good news doesn't stop here. Even as the number of active capital projects has increased over 80% since the beginning of my tenure, 85% of our projects have been on time and 87% have been on budget in construction. Simply stated, we've taken on more projects and finished them faster. Under my tenure, with the help of Deputy Commissioner Braddock, the Parks Department has improved its efficiency. We're proud of these achievements over the past several years and welcome this chance to update the Council on our continued work. With tremendous support from Mayor Bill de Blasio and in partnership with the City Council, New York City Parks will continue to find innovative ways to improve the quality of life for New Yorkers all over this great city. To provide some important context and clarity of misconceptions, the Parks Department does not have its own capital process. New York City Parks shares the same capital process as DDC, DOT, and DEP, among others. The process is affected by state law, local law, executive order, union contracts, public support, contractors, weather, and market forces, along with other factors. A change in any of these individual factors can accelerate or delay a project, but none of them is inherent to parks projects. By modernizing and streamlining the parts of the process we do control, we've been very successful. We've cut design time from the typical landscape project in half. We are getting projects through PDC at a much improved rate, 93% in FY19 versus 20% before my tenure. We reduced the number of change orders by 50% from 2014, to, I'm sorry, for FY14 to FY19. We've modernized by creating new capital bid solicitation systems, which allows contractors to view upcoming projects and download the solicitation documents online rather requiring them to travel to our capital headquarters in Flushing Meadows Corona Park. We've launched our capital tracker, our first of its kind transparency tool that provides real-time information on all of our active capital projects. A recent example of our hard work can be seen in Astoria. Astoria Park is one of our five anchor parks, a 150 million initiative launched by the mayor to restore parks with historical underinvestment, high surrounding population, and the potential for development. The first phase of Astoria Park included restructuring a running track, creating adult fitness area, and rebuilding surrounding pathways, lawn areas, drainage system, as well as creating a new synthetic soccer turf field with seating, bleachers, and erosion control. The start date on the construction was November of last year with a scheduled completion by May 2020. Thanks to our reforms, the whole project lasted less than three years, start to finish, and an amazing accomplishment for a project of this size. And we were able to finish this project in construction seven months early. Now we have more than 100 projects finished 
ahead of schedule since the beginning of FY15. It's the nature of public-facing work to hear a lot more about what is going wrong than what is going right. Parks projects are among some of the most visible public work projects in the neighborhood and are some of the more impactful. They also receive direct investment from local elected officials to whom I am most thankful for their partnership and support. We understand the angst around these projects and we want to build further on these accomplishments and participate in citywide efforts to improve the capital process that all of our sister agencies work within. But I hope this hearing helps to correct the record. I am proud I have led the reforms within New York City Parks. We are an agency that has demonstrated a nimble and smart approach to building within city rules. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to discuss the agency's improvements to its capital projects and to provide an overview of our agency's recent efforts and initiatives in building our city's green and open spaces for all New Yorkers. Now I turn the floor over to Deputy Commissioner Braddock for a presentation on the capital process, successes, and challenges so far. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Silver, and good morning, everyone. As Commissioner Silver stated, I'm Therese Braddock, Deputy Commissioner of Capital Projects at New York City Parks. I know there are several council members who haven't seen our capital process presentation, so I'll begin with an overview of what is involved in the process, followed by some of the specific changes and improvements we've made over the past few years, and then finish with some of the challenges we still face. The Capital Division is responsible for managing design and construction projects across the agency's portfolio. More than 30,000 acres of parkland spread over hundreds of playgrounds, buildings, athletic fields, pools, beaches, recreation centers, and nature centers. Just about everything you can imagine in a park, we built or reconstructed. And to fund these projects, we have $4.9 billion in our 10-year capital plan. To qualify for the use of capital funds, each project has to have a minimum value of $35,000 and be in place for at least five years. So when you think about reconstructing a playground, baseball field, or comfort station, those are all pretty typical examples of what we work on. The $4.9 billion in our budget isn't just for parks capital. The capital division directly manages about half of the overall capital budget. The remainder is managed by other divisions and agencies, including our citywide services division, forestry, purchases of vehicles and equipment, and land acquisitions. About a quarter of our capital budget is managed by other agencies on our behalf, primarily DOT, DDC, and EDC. Currently, among the parks divisions, we have over 600 active capital projects in the three phases of, cap of a capital project, design, procurement, and construction. And as you can see, over the past few years, the number of active projects has increased significantly, 85% since fiscal 13. In particular, I want to call your attention to the fact that we have many more projects in procurement. In his testimony, Commissioner Silver mentioned that there is no parks-specific capital project. There's one capital process that every city agency follows, and this is most true in procurement. Procurement is very heavily regulated by numerous state and local laws, and it's the area where parks and every other city agency that manages capital projects has the least amount of power on its own to make changes or streamline the process. Next, I'd like to briefly walk th you through the process of completing a capital project from start to finish. First is the project identification phase, which is when we identify a potential project, put together a cost estimate, and request funds from one of our funders. This happens throughout the course of the year whenever a need is identified. We receive funding from the mayor, council members, and borough presidents, as well as some grant funding. We find out the majority of funding we receive for each fiscal year at budget adoption for the start of the upcoming fiscal year in July. It's important to note here that we are asked to put together a cost estimate at this very early stage, prior to our community input meetings with stakeholders when we're told what they would like to see built, and prior to performing any testing at a site to know the existing conditions. This, as you all know, and as I've heard today, can lead to discrepancies with the initial estimate down the line. 
The next phase is project initiation. After we receive all the funding we think we need for a project, we have an in-house designer or consultant on board, we hold what's called a pre-scope meeting with our internal stakeholders at Parks, and then we hold a larger community meeting with our external stakeholders, the public. Note that on the slide and on the following slides, we've noted our standard time frame for completing each phase, assuming all goes according to plan. The design phase is obviously when we get into the detail of designing a project. There are many steps in the design phase, and what people don't always realize and that there's, is that there's a lot of engineering that goes into designing parks and playgrounds. We capture water at each site to help out the storm systems. We design for resiliency and accessibility. We also have a lot of external regulatory reviews on our design projects. And one of our hallmarks is that we're proud that we go back to the community during design to ensure that what we're designing is what they have asked for at the original input meeting. And although this adds some time, we think it's vital to include the community in the process. We also want to make sure that what we're designing can be maintained, so we make sure to check in with our maintenance and operations division to get their feedback. And we also want to make sure that we're what, what we're designing can be built, so we reviewed the designs with our construction staff. The next phase in the, in the process is procurement, which is when we get a contractor on board. Unfortunately, this isn't the type of process where you're renovating your kitchen or your bathroom and you get to call three contractors to get three quotes and then you just make a decision based on price and experience. The city has a very extensive review process that can take sometimes upwards of a year to complete and there are a lot of oversight agencies involved in the decision making. This process requires that we award the job to the lowest responsive, responsible bidder. It's important to note that 73% of this process is governed by oversight agencies outside of the Parks Department, so we don't control the majority of this phase. We and other mayoral agencies hear frequently that the Economic Development Corporation and the School Construction Authority can move their projects a lot faster than Parks. Unlike mayoral agencies, EDC is a nonprofit corporation and SCA is a state authority. As such, they are exempt from some of the rules and regulations that govern, govern procurement for mayoral agencies like parks. And a lot of these reviews and initiatives were put in place for very good reasons, but the trade-off is that they can sometimes add time. The last phase in the process is construction. This is pretty self-explanatory. However, it doesn't mean that construction is always easy. Similar to design, there are many coordination steps with other agencies, including the MTA, Con Edison, National Grid, DEP, and DOT. Typically, we allow for a 12-month schedule for our landscape architecture projects, which are very weather dependent, and we allow for an 18-month 18 18-month schedule for our building projects. In order to illustrate further some of the coordination required in all of our projects, I'd like to quickly run through a case study with you, focusing on the first phase of the Astoria Park Anchor Project that Commissioner Silver mentioned in his testimony. In the design phase, because this project is near the water, we had to create a stormwater pollution prevention plan and submit that to the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. We also worked with City DOT on our lighting plan, since they actually maintain the lights in all of our parks, and on our maintenance and protection of traffic plan to make sure that we aren't impeding access to the neighborhood with our project. Our design was submitted to the Public Design Commission for three separate reviews, conceptual, preliminary, and final, all to ensure that the design meets the city's high standards for its public spaces. And since the project was next to the RFK Triborough Bridge, the TBTA required a review of our construction documents to ensure that our work wouldn't impact the structure. In construction, again, because we're on the water, we had to do inspections on a weekly basis and after heavy rains to make sure that water runoff from the site wouldn't run into and possibly pollute the East River. We also had to do post monitoring construction to ensure compliance with the stormwater plan. We also had to coordinate with Con Ed for all of our electrical hookups, and we had to document the final product for PDC to ensure that we had built the project as it was approved. Building projects can be even more complicated with approvals for gas, water, fire alarms, building codes, et cetera. 
We are incredibly proud of the Astoria Park project, which started design in November 2016 and was completed in October 2019, under three years from start to finish. We had a great design, we had no issues in procurement, we had a great contractor and no surprises in the field, complemented by some great weather. We also attribute a lot of these shorter time frames to many of the changes we've been making to the parts of the capital process that we do have control over. And I want to take a few minutes to highlight some of these for you. Efficiency and transparency have been two of our main goals over the past few years. As I'm sure you all know by now, just over five years ago, we created what's called the Parks Capital Tracker. There's a screenshot of this on the right. We have all of our active projects on the tracker, and we show start and end dates for each phase, funding information, project updates, and schematic designs. We've had almost 800,000 hits on the tracker since it went live, so it's quite popular. A huge help is that we've hired 130 people over the past few years, and I want to thank the council for supporting our staffing requests. These new staff members have helped us clear our backlog of projects and meet our commitment of getting projects into design in the same year when they are fully funded. And we've also established monthly meetings with Commissioner Silver called Red Zone Meetings, where we go over projects that need commissioner-level assistance to move them along. One of the biggest changes we've made over the past few years is the creation of a capital needs assessment program. Commissioner Silver implemented this program to help the agency make more data-driven decisions about what sites are most in need of renovation. We've hired, se hired several engineers and architects who go out to inspect our assets, including comfort stations, recreation centers, retaining walls, and synthetic turf fields to assess conditions and determine what work needs to be done. We've also received $1.8 million in expense funding to do pre-design testing once a, fully, once a project is fully funded, which helps us to better understand what type of work needs to be done at the site and helps decrease the number of surprises once we get into construction. We then work with borough commissioner's offices, who then work with each of you to prioritize which pro projects we should put in funding requests for in the coming year. Once the projects are fully funded, we establish a clear community input meeting process and set expectations. Previously, our co community meetings were held during the day, usually at the site. Now we've, had, we've held our community input meetings at night in a public location and we've made huge outreach efforts over the past few years to make sure that all interested parties are aware of this meeting and are able to give their comments. We've also established that community input meeting as a start date for design. Some of the changes we've made in design include streamlining our internal meetings from five to two. We've also increased the use of standard templates where we can, and we've updated our staff's tasks and standards and written standard operating procedures. We've completely overhauled our project management software to do a better job of tracking approvals and schedules, and we've hired two professional estimators who are using software to develop project estimates. All of this helps create a clear path for projects, improves transparency, and creates clear expectations for the public, elected officials, and our staff for how projects should move forward. And we're proud to tell you that it has had a dramatic effect on how we were able to complete projects in design. For our single site landscape projects, which is about half of all our capital projects, we've basically cut design time in half since fiscal 14. Moving into procurement with the understanding this is the part of the process we don't have much control over, we've made some improvements where we can. We created a new automated system to put our contract books together where a project manager simply has to answer a series of questions about their project, and all of the correct documentation for the contract is automatically pulled in. This new system took a process that used to take two weeks and reduced it to two hours. And as of October 23rd, we have made our contracts available online, so contractors can now download them directly instead of having to come to our offices in Queens to pick them up. This should help increase our pool of bidders and we've been reaching out to contractors proactively to make sure they know about these important changes. And we've also held one-on-one -on -one meetings with them to better understand their concerns. 
And finally, as a couple of weeks ago, OMB is now allowing us to use a shorter form with less documentation for many of our smaller projects with simple scopes, which we hope will help expedite the funding approval process for these projects. In construction, one of the biggest changes we've made over the past years is limiting design changes when a project is in construction. This is one of the reasons why we focus so much in design on getting consensus from all of our stakeholders, ensuring that what we're designing can be built and maintained. Any changes in construction can add time and money to a project, which we always want to avoid. We've also established a training program for our resident engineers who oversee our construction projects so it's clear what they should be monitoring in the field. And we've also digitized our submission process for shop drawings and samples so that contractors can get approvals more quickly. These changes in construction have really helped us increase the number of projects we complete each year and faster than ever. In fiscal 19, we completed almost a quarter of our projects at least one month ahead of schedule. Our officially reported statistics to the mayor's office also bear this out. We have a goal of completing 80% of our construction projects on time and 85% on budget. Since we started implementing all of these changes, we've met or exceeded these goals, which we're very proud of. But even though we've made so much progress, we realize there is still much more to do. We have a couple of focus areas right now, both of which are, cent are centered on the costs of delivering projects, which we wanted to share. Earlier, I mentioned that we had hired two estimators for our in-house jobs. Currently, the majority of our estimators are done by our in-house design staff, and we realize this is an important enough function that we need to have a separate group to put together our estimates. We've asked OMB for additional estimators so that we can create a more cohesive, centralized estimating team and a more standard approach to our project estimates. This team would create all the initial capital needs estimates, work with designers to help create cost estimates during design, and analyze high bids and change orders when costs come in higher than expected. The other big focus area for us right now is comfort stations, since we agree wholeheartedly with your comments that these buildings are too costly to build. We're now exploring several different options, including trailers, modular and prefabricated options, and a fur further value-engineered version of our standard design. To that end, we'll also be working with PDC in the future to ensure that the design is as attractive as it is affordable. And we've been speaking to several contractors to get their feedback on how to bring these costs down. But as much as we have improved, and even though we have more improvements on the horizon, there are still challenges we face in our day-to-day -day execution of capital projects. As both Commissioner Silver and I have stated several times today, the procurement process is where, the procurement process is where we have the least amount of control. Even though we have made internal changes to what we have control over, cycle times have increased by 38% from fiscal 14 to fiscal 19, from a median cycle time of eight and a half months to almost 12 months. Again, this is due to laws, policies, and oversight involved, and there's very little that Parks can do on its own, rather other than advocate for solutions. Unless significant legislative changes are made to this process, we don't expect to see substantial improvements. This slide emphasizes the fact that more than 70% of the procurement process is regulated by specific laws or policies that all city capital agents have to follow, not just Parks. And I want to reiterate what Commissioner Silver sta stated. Again, it's a citywide process, not a Parks Department process. If you want to make improvements, it would be very helpful to bring all of the oversight agencies together to, di to discuss potential changes. Some of the other challenges we face are the high volume of contracts we have, over 600, as well as the relatively small pool of contractors that bid on our site work projects. Because Parks has smaller dollar value projects, we're seen as a good entry point for new contractors to get their feet wet and learn the city's processes. And because we're required to award to the lowest responsive, responsible bidder, we sometimes award to a contractor who doesn't have a lot of experience, which then requires our contract and construction staff to teach the contractors the ropes. 
Another important challenge to note is that we also have difficult sites to deal with, often contaminated parcels that are close to the waterfront, resulting in more regulation and hurdles to jump through. Lastly, there has been a lot of legislation added to the process, and while much of it is added for a good reason, it sometimes adds time and money to our timelines. So, in conclusion, as Commissioner Silver so succinctly described, we've made a lot of progress in speeding up our design and construction, and we're always looking for how we can do things better. We realize that this isn't the end of the line. We are happy to continue to work with the Council and others involved to come up with additional ways to streamline our process. Thank you, Commissioner Silver and Deputy Commissioner uh, Bladek for your detailed and informative uh, testimony. Uh, now we're gonna go into questions. Uh, I will ask a few questions and then we'll, uh, Council Member Gibson will ask a few questions and then followed by Council Member Kalos. And then we'll go to members to ask questions. And all members, are, our questions are limited to five minutes due to the amount of people, amount of members we have here. And we had to finish the meeting before 1 p.m. here. All right. Commissioner Silva, thank you for your dedicated service uh, to the city of New York. Uh, many other city agencies perform uh, capital projects, whether it's the Department of Design and Construction, uh, Department of Transportation, or other state authorities, like the SCA, uh, which is a school construction authority, we understand the need for them <coughs> to operate differently. They all serve different functions and need separate freedoms to complete their work. What are some of the constraints that the department operates under that the other agencies do not? And what are some practices the other agencies engage in that will help part department uh, run capital projects more efficiently. To be clear, uh, there are certain practices we can learn uh, from DDC under Commissioner Grillo just released the blueprint, uh, included some recommendations we had, but some of their own. Uh, so certainly front end planning from DDC is something we'll take a look at. But referring to SEA in your remarks, uh, we and DDC follow the same process. Uh, SEA, as was stated in our slide, does not have to follow some of the processes, uh, so they're able to move their projects quicker. Uh, but certainly working with DDC and MOX, uh, there are some positive signs on the horizon through the Passport Initiative and looking at some of DDC's blueprint recommendations. Uh, we believe that is the path forward but all the city agencies uh, deal with the same constraints, uh, which was just presented uh, in these slides, and we offered some recommendations about the path forward, which is really on the regulatory side. So um, what is the current average time frame for community parks initiative CPI projects? Do they go through the process more expeditious and faster than other capital projects? Yeah, if so, uh, why? All capital projects uh, right now are averaging between three to four years. So there is no faster time frame for the Community Parks Initiative. We're now on the final phase. Uh, there was a three year tranche of each one of these initiatives of the 67 parks, and they ran about the same as all other parks. Uh, this Community Parks Initiative, along with the reforms I put in place, happened at the same time. And so we did have to deal with uh, 130 projects that preceded my tenure. We had to deal with that backlog, but 2014 is when CPI started, also started our reform. So on average, it's about three to four years on average to complete a capital project for a parks capital project here in New York City. Thank you. So. Uh the controller released an audit in 2018 that cited numerous issues regarding how past department manages construction, man manages construction management firms who oversee capital projects. What is the criteria by which the past department determines that it's most, uh, that 
it must contract with construction management firms to run and administer capital projects. Uh, so thank you for the question. To be clear, uh, that report was released uh, about a year ago, but it was based on analysis done in FY14 and 15. Because of our reform and other changes, the recommendations in the controls report had already been addressed or in the process of being addressed. So we communicated that to the controller's office. We understood those recommendations. But by the time we received that report, all of those recommendations had already been addressed or in the process of being addressed. OK. So but can you tell us like, how many current projects are being managed by construction managed uh, firms? We'll, we'll have to get back to you on that number. We do have over 620, but we'll get back to you uh, on that yeah. number. All have resident, majority have resident engineers associated with them. There are some other boiler projects, HVAC projects, but we'll can get you that number if that's what you want, Council Member Koo. Yeah, lastly, what has been the trend in recent years regarding the use of construction management firms to manage capital projects? We use uh, construction management firms to, to manage construction on our projects only yeah. when it is needed. Our preference is always to use in-house staff to manage our, our projects. So it is only done when we have a lack of staffing um, or if we have a lot of projects obviously going on at the same time. So what are the criteria? It's just it, it's usually just a staffing a staffing issue if we do not have an in-house person or if we don't have an in-house person that we feel has the doesn't have the expertise for it. Thank you. Yeah, we are also joined by Councilmember John Nye, Councilmember Rosenthal, and Councilmember Miller. Uh, now I go to questions uh, to uh, Councilmember Gisher. Thank you again, Chair Kuhl, and good afternoon, Commissioner and Deputy Commissioner. Thank you for uh, the presentation. Uh, all of the council members here should have a copy of it. And I think for us, it gives us a greater understanding of the process that Parks undertakes going from project initiation to project completion. And I appreciate the honesty of recognizing all of the challenges that can happen from A to Z. Um, in terms of procurement, the bidding process, because for many instances, council members such as myself and others are often asked when projects are put out to bid and you receive the bids back, there are instances where the projects are significantly over the bid in terms of what we estimate the project to be. So I wanted to ask and frame uh, some of my questions just around a lot of the testimony that you've provided as it relates to fully funded projects and some of the uh, successes that you stated. Um, the fiscal 2019 in the mayor's management report, the MMR states that 90% of projects completed in our fiscal 2019 were at or below budget and that 86%, as you said, were completed on time. So I wanted to specify and ask, what does it mean to parks when we say at or under budget, what does that metric look like? Basically, that means that if there was a budget, we were able to either do it on budget or under budget. So there was a lot of reference to the early part of the testimony about cost overruns. Correct. As you can see from these numbers, that is no longer the case. We're able to meet the mayor's target, which is 80%, to meet or exceed that. So you're not seeing these projects that are having these excessive cost overruns. We're very careful on a monthly basis of watching the cost and minimizing change orders. We went from 400 to 100 change orders because we know that could be both costly and timely, and so we monitor the budget very carefully. So I guess the, the myth about parks of having cost overruns is really a thing of the past and no longer in the future. And if you saw from the chart, really from fiscal year 2015 and on, we have consistently exceeded the target of having projects both on time and on budget. Okay, so for the projects that are under budget, where there is a projected amount and we save, there's some cost savings achieved, where does that revenue go? So if you have a project that would be essentially over budget, would that money that's saved in one project go to another project? Where does that revenue go? Uh, if it is council money, we meet with council finance because okay. that is something we have a little discretion uh, to okay. reallocate. So we do have those conversations uh, with council finance to determine if we're under budget, uh, how will that money be uh, reappropriated. 
uh, if it's mayoral money, then we have a little bit more discretion. Uh, so that's basically the two options, as well as a borough president. So we do not have the discretion, if it's non-mayoral money, to move that to cover uh, other projects. Okay. And at a, an earlier parks hearing, I believe this year, um, under Chair Cool, um, it was stated that the on-time metric that we use um, from the Parks Department measures the on-time progress during the construction phase. So it doesn't look at from project initiation to project completion in terms of what's defined as on time, but rather during the construction. Is that our accurate understanding? And if that is the case, is there an, a reason why the Parks Department takes that approach? Uh, that is accurate. Uh, these metrics were developed by the mayor's office. Uh, I'm sure we're open to looking at other measures in the future, but you're absolutely correct. Year over year, since what we call these MMR, the Mayor's Management Report, was the target that we used was specifically for construction. Okay, I understand. And so you're aware it's not just parks, but other agencies have that same metric as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and I asked that question because as an example, I mean, it happens, it has happened with, and within my district when a bid came in higher and we needed to go back for additional funding. Um, I was wondering, would that delay show up in our metrics? And would there be a better measure that not just parks, other agencies would consider to make sure that projects are delivered on time and not just construction timeline? Uh, thank you for the question. While there isn't an MMR target, we have t internal metrics to determine from design, procurement, and construction, which is why we were able to share these numbers with you in this slide presentation. So we do have internal tracking. As I had mentioned, uh, we've seen huge savings on the design side. It was not so the case on the procurement side, but it's something we certainly can track. But we're now seeing that the design is coming in as predicted as well as construction. So we have those internal numbers. It's just not required as the MMR for parks and other city agencies that have capital projects. Okay, so the process for tracking um, against the schedule within the design and the procurement phases are tracked internally by parks? Correct. Okay, would you be willing to share some of that data with the city council, with our parks committee? Yes. And the subcommittee? Yes, and I believe Mox also tracks that data as well, but the answer is yes. Okay, and I wanted to ask, you've referenced it twice about the change order reduction. And I have a little bit of a construction background, so I know about change orders. And I wanted to ask what your, um, in terms of how that came about and what has the parks been doing to provide that reduction in change orders. And also I know it's been stated and obviously I'm very happy to hear it, but we're looking at more standardization of our designs. Um, when we have scoping meetings on the ground, she talked about the internal, so the external. Um, meetings that we have with our stakeholders in the community, trying to get the best design, but looking at a standard, right. what I appreciate is that having this standardized process, there is already some sort of a design that's presented to the community and we're not starting from scratch. So what were some of the policies that you looked at that caused such a shift in change orders? Well, I guess the luxury of being both a town manager in New Jersey and being a consultant, uh, having a background in architecture, I knew the impact that change orders can have, and so I sat down. This was my first summer here in summer 2014, and looked at a number of change orders and the reasons, and I had instituted a new policy, unless it was for life safety or serious site conditions, there will no longer be a change order. Uh, in the past, uh, someone may have a new design idea they wanted to implement, but that was no longer going to be accepted or tolerated. And we limited the design down from five to two to remove the pe potential for change orders in the field. Staff is now instructed if it's for life safety or for a serious site condition that must be addressed, we will allow the change order. So that's basically the genesis of what occurred. And with that new approach, we're able again to reduce our change orders uh, from 400 to 100 on average per year. Okay. And do we expect that to continue? It's been continuing the past couple of years, and staff hearing me say that right now, they got the message and it's been working. Uh, they do appreciate, as well as the contractors, also appreciate a few change orders because it can take 
a lot of time to process the change order and for the contractor to get paid, so it does eliminate a lot of hurdles and pain for both staff and the contractors and ultimately the public that's waiting for their park to be opened. We believe this has been a huge uh, change in our ability to deliver projects on time. Okay. Um, most recently, the Parks Department, the capital process, there was an overview presentation given to the City Council and the administration and our Capital Projects Task Force, um, which has been up and running. We identified a practice of requiring cost estimates prior to soliciting community input as a challenge because it ultimately can result in funding shortfalls when the community requests a different scope than what we expected. So I wanted to understand why we decided to approach it in this order um, and why not solicit community input first and then once we have a better understanding what the scope could be, then we would secure cost estimates and secure funding. So it seems like we're doing it the opposite way, so I just wanted your thoughts on that. That is a great question, Council Member. It's something we are exploring and have tested okay. because of our volume, typically for us to engage either the mayor's office on potential funding or an elected official or a president or council, we need a rough estimate of what type of funding will be needed as we approach the budget. Uh, we'll see how we can shift gears because, as I stated, we have well over 100 projects a year. To have those 100 additional meetings in addition to the design meetings we have uh, could be a bit of a challenge, but something we can see if we can explore in some limited cases. So it is a great idea. We have tested okay. at least twice, uh, and it's something we can see if we could expand further. But initially, because we need to get the ball rolling, uh, we need some funding in place, we do make a rough estimate. Then when we meet the community, we understand what program they want, and in many cases, it is higher. The elements they want, the amenities, is higher than that original estimate. Okay, and I just have one more question back on the standardized design. Um, are there other elements of parks that where we're looking at standardizing designs, not just parks, but on page three of the presentation, it gives you a layout of all the different monument centers, nature centers, et cetera. So is that the case across the board or just specific to parks? Well, for our case, uh, it is limited to right now comfort stations and also okay. play equipment. In Got the it. past, if there was a fire department theme, because we're naming the playground after uh, a fallen firefighter, it may be themed, which meant that play equipment was customized. We've now moved away from that in order to speed construction and are focusing on what the manufacturer has available. So you'll see this new style of play equipment that is already something we can purchase and not fabricate and customize, which causes delays. So I would say the playgrounds, the adult fitness equipment, these are things we can purchase, quote unquote, off the shelf, where in the past we would have to fabricate some of the play equipment. If you see Domino Park, for example, that's heavily fabricated. Uh -huh. Uh, and we're going to more standardized equipment for our comfort stations as well as our play equipment. Okay, uh, just two questions before I turn it over to our chair. Um, in terms of the RFPs, you've indicated that we now solicit bids for capital projects using an online RFP process, which you know I understand is a more efficient way um, to welcome contracts. I'm sorry, welcome uh, bids rather. I wanted to understand, are you receiving more bids now that we've moved to an online process? And an earlier comment I made is looking at the arena by which we work with different providers. Everyone in New York City is not building playgrounds and basketball courts. That's the reality. And so if you look at patterns over the last several years of this administration, we've worked with a similar number of providers. Are we looking at expanding that opportunity with some of the MWBE uh, components that we are working under? Have you seen more bids? Are they more diverse? Are they coming from different areas? Um, how are we looking at this online RFP process to solicit more providers that would be able to give us even better bids so that we have a bigger environment to work in? Well, just to clarify, they can pick up the documentation. They can't submit online. I'll let okay, the correct, Deputy Commissioner right. clarify. Okay, but in terms you. of MWBE, you're absolutely on target, as was mentioned. Very often, Parks is an entree opportunity for many of our MWBEs. We rank second in the city with 20% of our awards going to MWBEs, both on the prime and sub. And we're always looking to expand our pools. So if any of the council members have interested parties, please send them our way. 
Uh, with that now, I'll turn it over to Deputy Commissioner to see if she has anything she wants to add, but we're always looking to expand our pool and it's mm -hmm. to our benefit to have as many contractors bidding on our jobs as possible. Okay. Hi, may I, may I interrupt for a minute? I have to go next door to vote. Uh, oh, yeah, then, right. So uh, during my, my absence, yep. Councilmember Gibson will take over, okay? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, the, the system in, that allows you to pick up the, the bid books online just came available October 23rd. So oh, it's a okay. little bit too soon for us to be able to tell, but w we believe and um, we'll be sure to be tracking how many people pick it up online as opposed to those that's, that still pick it up at, at our building in Flushing Meadow Park. Okay, and in terms of expanding the MWBE opportunities, are there other outreach efforts that we've embarked on and where do you see that going moving forward? Uh, through the mayor's office, uh, we meet on a regular basis. We have recruitment fairs and events. Uh, we actually go out and try to solicit a variety of ways. And so we have dedicated staff within the capital division that is responsible for that recruitment, uh, participating both in our fairs as well as citywide fairs to uh, recruit. And we uh, reach out to our general contractors to make sure that they are actually seeking and meeting their targets for MWBE. So it is part of our program and something, as I stated, we rank number two in the city of all city agencies, and we want to continue to do better so we can claim the number one spot. Okay, I see you're in the top top three. Top, we're number two. Number so two. Top all three. Right. Answer is yes. Okay, we get the silver good. medal. I like silver. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I love that we aim high. That's good. Um, I wanted to see if you could expand a little bit. I know there's, you know, it's obviously an ongoing conversation, but some of the metrics that we're looking at in terms of comfort stations, you mentioned portable trailers, you mentioned a smaller comfort station. I think the bottom line, what we all care about is not necessarily what it looks like on the outside, the cleanliness, the availability of comfort stations. And for some of us that have comfort stations in construction today, what we can do to provide as an alternative in that park for park goers that have been used to having a comfort station, but now it's under construction for the next year. Um, are you looking at alternatives for that in terms of like porta potties and other things that could be provided in absence of a comfort station? Uh, thank you for the question. In some cases, you some cases yes, we do provide uh, a porta potty. It varies from project to project. Some of the larger parks we do it. If the entire playground is closed, it's most likely we're not going to do it. But to answer your other question, we heard loud and clear uh, the cost of comfort stations, which is to some extent out of our control. We've been meeting with contractors to find out exactly why the price is so high. Uh, unfortunately, it has not passed the $4 million threshold. Some cases it has been over $3 million, and that caused us to say this is uh, unacceptable and getting too high. And so we start to do a nationwide analysis to find out how can we look at other models that are out there. The Portland Loo with the using in Boston, using other prefab construction. That work is underway. We're meeting with PDC to find out what would satisfy them so if we do take this approach it would be easier through the approval process that work is ongoing but we're optimistic that we can start looking at new ways of bringing smaller restrooms it may not be a comfort station a restroom to more parks at a much more inexpensive cost so that work is now underway and we hope to initiate something soon okay great um we'll circle back as other uh, members have questions i'll now turn it over to uh chair kalos Thank you, Chairs Koo and uh, Gibson. Uh, Commissioner, in your testimony, you cited 648 completed projects, 130 uh, delayed projects, nearly complete, 85% uh, on time, 87% on budget. Uh, how many projects are you currently managing, and what do you keep track use to keep track of all these projects? Uh, it's around 620, and through our tracker, uh, that tracker does a lot that's going on behind the scenes. And so the data, which I won't bore you, there's a whole database that populates the tracker system. So through that, we're able to manage uh, all stages of construction percent complete, and it's actually in real time. That gives us the ability in this monthly meeting that if there's a project starting to slip, goes to our red zone so we can keep it moving along. So it is a database behind the scenes that populates the capital tracker. 
You said data to the wrong person. I love data. I'm glad you like data. We like so, data too. Uh, so in terms of the capital projects tracker that's public facing, it's substantially different than what you have. It sound, is, that, is that the case? It's or virtually it's the, same? the same. You're seeing the visual representation of what it is. So we're able to, the same information, we're putting it in a way that the public would understand. Rather than seeing a database, they'll see comp percent complete. And it's done in real time. Each day, that number moves if some work in a project had been completed. The capital project tracker, I, I, I went into the open data platform, downloaded your back end, uh, and it's, it's not available as a uh, human readable format. So if you can please make sure that it is. It is XML, so I imported it from XML into a data, into a table. And uh, I found three records for every project ID. So you do have a little bit of messiness on your back end, so that may be causing some problems for you on your back end. But uh, my analysis, so right now you have 5,613 separate uh, rows that you're tracking, but in my quick analysis, your project tracker has 1,900 projects. So what it, can you share a little bit of what the discrepancy is? You are, I'll see whether the Deputy Commissioner, you're waving on my expertise, but I, I'm confident we have staff that could answer that question. Uh, are I'm they here? I'm not sure that I can completely, but, but I'm, I'm guessing, I'm not sure what you're looking at, but I'm guessing for each project you have three phases. You have design, procurement, and construction, and that might be the three different phases that you're looking at, but I am not sure. Uh, the reason that there, there are three different entries is one of them separates out the funding source from the rest of the record. The other one separates out the location from the rest of the record, and the third one separates out the description. It's just an issue with uh, your back end that uh, can be fixed. But I guess the quick question is how many projects? Because you're saying 600, it's saying 1,900. No, it is 620, roughly. OK. Uh, and so I guess the uh, along those lines, uh, every is we, in terms of the, the design piece that you put up, if you can bring up slide 10. Uh, Diane. In my experience, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, when I put funding into a project, there is a 12-month wait before it goes to design. Uh, is that still the case? Or uh, is it no, just that for is me? not the case. Uh, once a project is fully funded, July 1, we just have to do some analysis uh, just to make sure what the project is. Some funding comes from different sources. Once we know it's fully funded and we have the project, uh, within that fiscal year, that project will be assigned to a staff person. In the past, that was not the case, that we could not assign all projects within the fiscal year. So it can take two months, it can take 10 months. It all varies on the borough and staff availability, but no, we do not expect the council member to wait uh, up to 12 months. On average, it happens during that fiscal year. I, I'm, I'm looking at uh, project uh, tracker ID 8633. Uh, it, it was funded quite a while ago when it said the design start was 2017. And I believe we funded it in 2015 I, or 16. I'll take a look at that record and get back to you. I don't. So what, what, is the, what is the maximum wait anyone would see before the design process starts? The maximum now is the longest would be about 11, 12 months. That's now. Before that, it so, could have been longer. Okay, so shouldn't we update the design slide here with another 12 months, what, two, two, no. zero to 12 months for just waiting? No, the analogy we use is that all planes cannot take off at the same time. On any given year, we get about 120 projects. We have to make sure per borough that we have the staff resources, or in some cases, we have to outsource it to a designer, but we make that assessment and it's done by borough teams. And so it is rare, because it starts to trickle down. We can do the most uh, in the earlier months, and then you'll see the number peaking down toward the end of the year. So a very small percentage has to wait 10, 11, 12 months. The vast majority happened before that. How, how do you decide which projects go first and which ones have to wait 12 months before it's, they even start the process? It's based on staff availability. If there's some complexity to it, we have to initiate local law 63, wait two months to assign it to an outside consultant. 
but we look very carefully. We do it by borough. And Queens seems to have the most projects, followed by Brooklyn. Uh, we look at those projects discreetly within the borough. As a designer becomes available, we can assign it because we don't want to have them overstretched and reduce the quality of our, of our capital projects. So it all depends on staff availability and if How we many have to staff, it. So it, have the number of projects you've been getting every year been going up or going yes. down? You saw from the slide it went up 85% from the time I arrived to where it is here now. We were able to hire an additional 130 staff. And although our volume has tremendously increased by 85%, we're still able now to be within that three to four year window of completing projects. The Parks Department pioneered requirements, contracts, and what have you. Uh, is, is there a business model that exists for having more staff during busy season? I'm not sure I understand the question. Is it when is it, it relates to capital? Is capital it, is are working 12 months out of the year on design, so I'm not sure I understand so the question. I, I, I guess the question is how, how can we get to a point where we don't have to wait 12 months just to start design? Because that can cut a year off the process. No, at least for me. Year, yeah, I mean, and my district and all the projects I've ever funded. Clearly, if there is uh, outsourcing, but even when we outsource, we have to have an internal project manager. Uh, we could look at additional staff, but where it was before to where it is now, we're moving these projects along a lot quicker. That commitment of having an assign within that fiscal year is a huge departure from years past, because it could take, in the past, up to two years to get the project assigned to a staff what, what was the headcount for your design team in, uh, for the July 1st, 2019 fiscal budget? Uh, just for the design team? Just the design team, okay, landscape architects, architects, engineers. Okay, 117 landscape architects, 30 architects, and 34 engineers. Is there any discrepancy between that and what was in the budgeted headcount? Uh, I'm sure we have vacancies. We always have vacancies at any given time. How many vacancies are you looking at right now? Right now, I think we're 50. Fifth, that's that's five a, zero. Yes, 50 that, vacancies. That's one. That that's like a. It's a, a large number. Yes. Why and what can we do? Well, I'm, people I'm, are watching I'm, right I'm, now. I'm, I'm flabbergasted. How uh, how do you run a design division with 50 vacant slots? We always look at the market of what is being paid and available out there in the market. Uh, and by way of just announcing it right here at this hearing, we're always hiring. If we have emerging design professionals that want to come work for parks, it's a great place. We encourage them to apply. How much and do landscape architects get paid, architects and engineers at parks? What is the salary level? Is it a civil service title? How do, how do people get these jobs? You, you heard it right here, right now. There are 50 jobs in the city of New York for people who want to design parks. And let me add, it's a great place to work. <laughs> so what, are, what is the salary levels and how does that compare to the private market? Um, you just offered a bunch of people watching on TV a job. How much are they going to get paid? Uh, I do not have the information off the top of my head of exactly each um, bearing in mind that within the landscape architecture title, you have several different um, levels in there. So it could be a starting salary. We'll, we'll have to get back to yeah, you to, since, a, since people are watching and are now excited about applying. Uh, we'll make sure we have those number where, right. They go where to can our they website. apply to these 50 jobs and NYC, how quickly can they get hired? They can go to NYC Parks and just type in Parks Jobs and it will take them right to the website and there are jobs available within the capital vision. I do believe we're competitive. We offer benefits, fringe benefits that the private sector does not offer. And plus they get to do extremely rewarding work of, of improving New York City parks for the next generation. So we encourage people who are interested to apply. I'm, can, can I'm, I on, your, I'm on your site and the only position I see under design and construction is landscape architect, lead mechanical engineer and capital support coordinator. Does, is that, are those three positions account for the 50 openings or are there more that need to be publicly listed? It's important to clarify that the 50 positions are across the entire division. It's not just for design. How, how many jobs are there across the entire division? There are, there are our head count right now is 468. Okay, and so how many of the design staff would you count that 50 if you were to estimate? Uh, 
I do not know that number off the top of my okay. head. I, I, I appreciate the honesty. I appreciate you letting us know that you are at least 10, more than 10% down and perhaps even a third down in terms of uh, your, your head count. Uh, how many people would you need so that the, when the rush of 100 or 120 projects comes in on July 1st that you're able to take those projects and move them forward without any delay? Uh, again, Council Member, we're doing that now. Uh, that is happening right now. If you look at the chart about but the number- But you testified that there might be a delay of up to 12 months before the It's not process. a delay. It's that once we get the funds, it is very difficult to assign 120 projects all at once. We look at the boroughs and then assign it when a staff person becomes available. It is not a delay. It's just that as you start to allocate work, you want to make sure you have the capacity to do the work. So I wouldn't call it a delay. It's just within that first year of just assigning the project to a staff person. How many staff do you need in order to make the process for assigning projects take less than 12 months? I'd have to get back to you because under my leadership, we were able to get it within the fiscal year. Before that, it was longer. I'll have to get back to you to find out what would on, it take to get to that number. On this same slide, internal review takes one month. Uh, is that a place where it could, where we could find some time savings? We already did. That used to be five reviews. It's now down to two. So now we're able to actually collapse that down. It used to be longer where five different leaders within parks used to review it. It was probably three months. We got down to one. Okay, can we get it down to weeks instead of months? In some cases, I'm, uh, possibly. But uh, it went from several months down to one month. That's where it was stated in testimony. We used to have five reviews from different leaders down to two. The next item is external reviews. So you are saying it takes three months at the community board? This is combined together. We have to go to community board, community board public design commission, uh, and in some cases, landmarks. It's rarely both, but it does take that time to schedule a meeting with the Public Design Commission, and also we have to meet with the community board. That's correct. I, I have never seen a project get three months of review at the community boards, and even with the Pl Public Design Commission, most of the projects move uh, fairly quickly. Uh, I know that a lot of folks have questions, but I think my, my point here is that I think that if we a, higher the number of people you need for your design team and make the assignments quicker. I think there's a chance to cut at least a year off uh, the timeline and how long people have to wait. Uh, in terms of uh, contracts, uh, I'm the contracts chair. You mentioned that all the contracts are now online. Where can I find those online? They are on the website, on the Capitol portion of the website. I'm on the Capitol Projects section of the website. Where in particular? In one second, and uh, we'll get some assistance and tell you exactly where to go. Thank you. If you can try to search contracts on the website. I did. And what came up? Ours are popped up as Ours contract resources. It's contract. I got business opportunities, capital projects, bid solicitations, bid results. Bid solicitations. So those are the, those are the bids. Um, where are the actual completed contracts? They're those not are, completed contracts. The, 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 you, what it is, it's you're allowing someone to pick up the actual book itself to bid on the project. Got it. Okay. So if you're following along, if you go to the park's website, you can't go and look at the contract that uh, for a completed project or a current project, you can look at opportunities to bid on projects. So thank you. I'll turn it back to the uh, chair. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Gwadenshi, you have questions, right? Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, Therese. I have to be very nice. She's a constituent. Commissioner, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I mean, you may not want it, but I'll give it to you anyway. Um, if you had a magic wand um, and could do one thing that would speed up this process, what would that be? 
It's a big if, I grant you. No, I, I'm, I'm pausing because uh, I don't know. I never had a magic wand, so I wouldn't know what to do. I'd probably create world peace and see what I could change. Uh, it's, it's limited Washington. to Fox contracting right. this magic wand. Okay? Not, not Washington, just all right. Uh, I think we're going in the right direction. Uh, there's been great headway. Uh, the administration's meeting with the capital agencies. Uh, I think procurement, we all recognize, is the area that we can focus on. And work is being done with mocks and passport. We're encouraged by some of the ideas from DDC and their blueprint. And so I'm very encouraged that, to me, the magic wand is that how we can just take a deep dive and look at procurement. I think our presentation uh, really highlighted that. So that would be my magic wand, is how we can just take a, a look at procurement and continue some of the reforms that we've been putting in place. All right, I'm just gonna ask another question, but I, I don't wanna preempt my colleague, Andrew Cohn, so I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna pause there and I'm gonna turn it back to the chairman. But thank you, good to see you, Commissioner. All right, thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Cohen? Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. How are you? Good morning. Uh, I know that there's been a lot of discussion on the amount of time, and I do think that, uh, echoing what uh, Chair Gibson said, I, I do think that some progress has been made. I mean, obviously on our end, it's frustrating that these projects take as long as they do. Uh, but I, I want to talk about cost. We seem to have like almost like just raised the white flag on cost, and as I, you know, allocate my precious capital dollars, it's becoming to me uh, not viable to fund, proc, fund parks projects because they're so expensive. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit, because, you know, and I, I, we've done this hearing, uh, you know, we all know the drill, we've done it before, but I've never seen any contractors here, and I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the universe of contractors, how many there are, if you bid a project, how many bids you tend to get, I, is it really a small universe, is it a big universe, what's going on out there? Well, thank you for the question. I do believe at a previous hearing we had the, the building industry to come in to shed some light about uh, what is happening in the market, and I did answer questions about just how expensive this market is. In terms of price, uh, this is one of the most expensive markets. Uh, this is a city that supports uh, our working families, workers. Uh, we have insurance that has to be addressed. We're looking at all those factors, but this is a very expensive city uh, to do work in. We don't mind taking a deeper dive. We've met with contractors to get some of their insight. We're addressing some of those issues. From our point of view, we're trying to figure out how to make construction cheaper, streamlining. We're no longer putting comfort stations in the middle of the park. We're putting it closer to the street so we minimize utility runs. As you see, we're now looking at comfort stations and restrooms of how it can be cheaper. We're standardizing our equipment. So when we put it out to bid, we're trying to minimize higher costs for projects, and that's what we're trying to do. But certainly, uh, we don't mind having conversation with contractors and bringing them in. In fact, one of the contractors knew about this hearing, came in, and wanted to also uh, address uh, both some support and some concerns that they have. So I think it would be a good conversation to have, uh, and it's something we do welcome. But they're hardworking firms. They're doing great work. Uh, we're seeing emerging MWBEs being very successful. Uh, and we're taking a hard look at how we can streamline and keep our costs down. Could you just though, address, like, the, the, on a typical, if you have a $5 million playground, a new build out of a playground, how many bids you get? Uh, and and sort of how many contract, you, you have 600 uh, capital projects going. How many contractors are in that universe that you're working with? I'll let the Deputy Commissioner answer, but on average we get three or four. If we get one or two, uh, it's very difficult to bid that out. Uh, in some cases we don't get any. So I think it varies on average, I would say three or four, but I'll let the Deputy Commissioner uh, provide more clarification. You know, the Commissioner's accurate. It is about usually three to four. Sometimes it can be up to 12, and then as he said, sometimes you might only have one bidder. And typically when you only have one bidder, uh, because there is no com competition there, we typically have to reject that bid and then rebid the project. And how many bidders are in your, I mean, in your stable? How many people are doing business with the Parks Department? And, and uh, uh, is it the lion's share going to a small group? Um, it's about six, 60, 59, 60, is that what you're? So about 60, our universe is about 60. And, and could, could you do, say, is 90% of the work going to a, a small percentage of that, or? 
I don't know that number. I, I don't know that percentage over the top of my head, but we can look that. Look I that would way. be interested in knowing. I mean, if you could provide us the the, the number of contractors who are building our parks yeah. and the percentage of work that they get, I think that that would be worth taking a look at. We do have a lot of um, repeat, um, but we also have, I think, as the commissioner explained, we do have a lot of new vendors that come in our way, and um, in some ways, it's uh, a little bit of a mixed bag. We're very proud of that fact that we're the entree to those new vendors, but it also sometimes is very difficult when they um, are not familiar with the city's process. And we also have to manage the number of projects any firm can handle so they're not overextended. So there is a balance, as even though with that existing pool, there are some we know that can handle many jobs or others that we have to give them just a few jobs. I, I guess just in, in my brief moments left, just to cut to the, what safeguards are there that there's not collusion among the bidders that, uh, I mean, it is, I understand the bureaucracy and as, as, as someone who works in government, I've gotten my head around a little bit that uh, the obstacles that you face and the challenges, but it's still very hard to fathom that a, you know, a comfort station is $3 million or $3.5 million. Van Cortland Park uh, abuts a neighborhood, Fieldston, and one time a constituent recommended, why don't we just buy one of the mansions in Fieldston with seven bathrooms and let people use it, because it would be cheaper than building the bathroom. And it's just, it, it's not easy to understand. Uh, again, we appreciate the question. We do welcome a further conversation about the cost. We did our own analysis to find out if there are any patterns we could determine. We didn't really see anything specifically. I do not believe there's collusion, and there are cases where I have to reject a bid. Once I saw the comfort station starting to approach four million, we had to reject that. We felt it was just, for the purpose of the taxpayers, there's no way that in clear conscience we could award that contract. So we're open to the conversation to see what we can do and to share what we're doing to keep some of those prices down. And it may be a different bathroom, I won't even say comfort station, a different bathroom or restroom in the future, but we're doing everything we can to keep those costs down. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, hello, Commissioner and team. Always great to see you. Uh, over the years, we have encumbered the procurement process with so many protections, each of which I think had a really well-meaning purpose originally to fight corruption and primarily but other ways to safeguard the public money. And it's added up to uh, something like a Rube Goldberg diagram flowchart. I've actually seen this. It takes up an entire hall uh, wall in, in, in very small font. You said in your opening statement, I think it was you or, or maybe it was Therese, that about three quarters of the time in that procurement process are steps which are um, in which you're at other agencies, um, where it's actually not sitting at the Parks Department. Um, so this could be everything from the City Law Department to Mayor's Office of Contract Services, um, it might be of the, the city's public design uh, commission. Uh, there may be cases where a DOT uh, has to sign off. I'm not sure about that. Um, do I have this right that such a huge portion of the time these, these, uh, these plans are stuck in other agencies? Could you ex expand on that a little bit and, and, and tell us what we can do as a city council uh, to push those agencies to expedite the process um, so that, again, 75% of the procurement is not stuck at non-parks agencies? Well, that, those conversations have already started. One we have recommended was Local Law 63. It is a small first step, but that's two months out of the design process, which would be most beneficial. As Councilmember Kahlo said, very frustrated by getting those parks assigned to a designer. Uh, that is one tool we use that is not in-house, but we use outside sources. But at the beginning of the year, it forces us to delay those projects by two months. So taking a look at Local Law 63 would be one. This is the chart you're referring to. Maybe we'll make a mural of it on a handball court somewhere in the city. Uh, <laughs> change of colors. Uh, but you're, you're correct. I think this is where the administration is taking a look at. But you're right. A lot of these rules were put in place for good reasons. So I think it does warrant a fresh look at how we can streamline this process because if one thing goes wrong, if we don't get a successful bid, 
and we have to restart. Those are three or four months. If there's due diligence, that's a long delay. So within this one, based on the rules, if one issue goes sideways, uh, it could potentially take this seven to 10 month process and could last up to a year and a half, if not longer. So could, this could, is could you identify which agencies are responsible for the longest time delays in the procurement process? I could just here are the agencies that we have to work with. I don't know if I could assign each of them are trying to move it out very quickly as possible, but there's MOX, OMB, Law, DOI, and then DLS, the controller, and then as I mentioned, we have both city and state laws we have to follow. So everyone is doing their part, it's just collectively, these are the rules that we have to follow, and I can name some of the issues if something goes wrong in this procurement well, process. Just to pick an example, so how, how much time does the law department take in the procurement process? About 30 days. 30 days. What are they doing for those 30 days? I don't know. They're reviewing the contract. Okay, so if we can push them to do that in a week, then we just save three weeks. What about, so DOI, Department of Investigation, meaning what, how much time do they take? They are allowed to take 30 days as well. Another 30 days. Uh, sorry, DLS is, is, is le legislative services, or what's, what's DLS? Labor. Labor. Ah, labor relations, you mean? Oh, the Department of Labor. Department of Labor, sir. And they're doing what? Uh, they're um, one, okay. one second. One we're second. Gonna, we'll get the right answer for you. Okay, I'm and sure I'm, right you know, I'm going to ask the same question about OMB and MOX. How much time are each of them taking, and why do they need that? OMB is allowed to take 30 days in order to process a CP. And uh, sorry, a CP is a certificate to proceed, which basically says the money is available for you to move the project forward. Right, so, so we, we, ha we have five agencies, each of which are given 30 days. Why couldn't they do that work concurrently? In some cases, they do. And are we pushing any of them to reduce that 30-day turnaround? We always push them to, and we always we track very carefully how many days that they take to do that. Okay. But we do not control the. I, I I know the parks doesn't parks department doesn't control it, and these agencies are not here to answer these questions. But I think we have identified an area that we have to push, which is agencies beyond parks, which are grabbing significant amount of time. If you sum it up collectively. Um, and I think we have to push every one of those agencies either to reduce the time it takes or to work concurrently with other agencies. Uh, we cannot have parks projects stalling for each of five agencies. You're not, you're not counting uh, PDC there either. Which PDC is in the design process. Ah, okay. Well, I'm gonna throw them in as well. Each of, so now we have half a dozen other agencies which stall the parks capital project process at one point or the other, and each of them we need to push to tighten up the timeline. But I think also, to be fair, that all of these agencies are following specific regulations. If, so if, if it's on us to change the rules, we'll do that. Someone needs to tell us what rules we need to change. Uh, I understand, as, I, as I said when I opened, this is the result of generations of good government work. Um, much of which originated from the council, but you add it all up and it becomes totally unworkable. Right. And it has been, it's it has led to unacceptably long uh, procurement and, 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 and design process. So if someone can tell us the laws to tweak, we'll do it, uh, and my time is up, but this is definitely something I think we need to pursue. Right, thank, you. thank you, Commissioner, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member Jonai. Thank you, Chairs. Um, council member, thank you for taking most of my questions. <laughs> for the record, Commissioner, uh, there is a guy that lost my voice, so I can't even beat up on you today. It's terrible. I'm sure you're disappointed. But for the record, we've gone through this a few times. The six agencies, mocks, OMB, law, DOI, DLS, and Parks Department. Don't they all fall under the control of this administration? Uh, yes, they do. So what's the problem? 
as I have stated, that those conversations with those agencies uh, uh, have occurred. Uh, MOX is now with their passport, is looking to streamline the process. So the, things are trending in the right direction based upon those conversations, but there's always room for improvement. Commissioner, very fond of you. I like you personally, and I really see the hard work that you've put into this. All that's going to take is this administration to come up with a real commitment to put all of you in one room and say, figure this out, but there's no desire. And I'm not looking to throw anyone under the bus, but when there's no leadership and there's no desire, there's your hands are tied. And I don't care to hold back anymore because this is the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. All of the issues that you've mentioned could have been addressed, should have been addressed, and it's not too late. But I assure you, for the next year and a half and two years, this administration is not going to solve this problem. There is no desire. Talk about comfort stations and that we're going to use, um, instead of stick building, that we have modulars. This was done in previous administration. And a decade later, we're coming right back to, well, why don't we look at modulars instead of having these structures built? We constantly waste time. We make it look like we're about to do something. Yeah, okay. We just make matters worse. Why aren't we doing more work in-house where we know that you can do it cheaper, quicker, more efficient, and save time and taxpayer dollars? And part of the problem that no one's alluded to is all of the money that comes out of our discretionary funding is posted for the world to know. So when I put $3 million in a budget for a skate park, every contractor knows I can bid up to $3 million. They know exactly what the previous projects or other projects have been given out. There's no inclination to shop it around. Using the transparency that we, by being too transparent, we are forcing the prices to go up. And there is price fixing. We've allowed it to happen. Every contractor knows a skate park in the Bronx that I put discretionary funding in for is $3 million. What do you think the bid's going to be? $3 million. What happens to the money on projects that we allocate, that we over-allocated? Where does that money go? Let me respond to a few of your questions. You had mentioned in-house crews. We have tested and in some cases used uh, in-house crews. Uh, because we have so many projects, we would have to hire an entire team. But there was a case in Staten Island where we uh, renovated a comfort station in-house. Uh, we did synthetic turfs in-house. But those staff are assigned to do all the borough trades. And so as a poly, we want to see if it worked. And it worked. But we would need to have an entire construction team to do that. Maybe a conversation for another time. But we, don't, we do know we can do it. And they do a lot of trade renovations within the borough. Uh, so that is to answer that question. Um, I don't know if you want to refer to it in a second. Uh, so, it is something we do explore, and we do save a lot of money, particularly on synthetic turf, on certain comfort station renovations, certain borough trades within our buildings doing outstanding work, and it's something we're going to explore more and more to do. Commissioner, thank you. But what's the holdup? Why can't we become or have an in-house contracting com contractors? It's successful. It works. It comes up to be a fraction of the cost. I appreciate the question. Uh, if you mentioned, we have about 60 contractors with very specialized talent. Uh, I don't know if Parks itself can have a whole construction team to build those 100 or so projects a year. It's something we'll sit down and explore with you, but I'm not sure how do we get from going from now a full construction team to build all park projects, but we are doing more and more in-house, and it is saving us some money.
not some, a lot. It's saving us. Yeah. And I'm going to just commission, uh, Chair, with your Thank permission, you. just to ask one more last question. I've lost all faith uh -huh. in this administration to not only address this issue, but when it comes to some of the more basic issues, we had to have, we held several months ago a grass summit meeting, bringing in parks, DOT, sanitation, just to figure out who is responsible to maintain parks and city property. No one admitted to their responsibilities. I've mentioned this to you in the past. Imagine we have all of these agencies with budgets and no one takes responsibility for the oversight and responsibility of maintaining of something that's so basic as just cutting grass. So why should we believe that any of these that issues that you brought up will be addressed? One, this is an administration that does have an outstanding reputation of getting things done. The one issue you spoke about in particular was a parkway, and if you recall, we got it cut. We thank you for bringing it to our attention, and as a result, we're looking harder at those assets where there may be joint jurisdiction. In terms of the capital process, I too have to applaud the administration that through mocks and passport and our ability to make some innovations, the ideas that DDC is bringing to the front has in fact moved things forward and we had a great deal of support for even for the parse capital process going from historically many, many years down to three to four years. So I'm optimistic about the changes we could make and this hearing is even highlighting that forward momentum that will continue making that progress going forward. So I ask you to uh, maintain your optimism or and I do believe that more positive change is on the way. We cut the grass. We don't know who is going to be responsible for the next grass cutting, Commissioner. And there's 30 plus locations like that throughout the city that I'm aware of where nobody claims responsibility, no one makes the necessary maintenance until months are spent trying to get something as simple as grass cut. So yes, the grass was cut by you in cooperation with DOT, but can you answer who's going to be doing the next scheduled grass cutting? We will have that answer for you very shortly, so we do not have to go through that pain again next season. Thank you. Thank you. Mm, we acknowledge uh, Council Member Eric join uh, join us, and he has a question. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Commissioner, uh, for your testimony. I did get a chance to read it over. I first want to uh, give a shout out, if I can, to my borough commissioner, Mike Dockett, who's doing an outstanding job uh, in the borough of Queens. His office is very responsive, and they've been very helpful to uh, a lot of my constituents with particular issues. So. Um, if you can give him a raise, give him a raise. He deserves it because he has to deal with people like me 24-7. I want to uh, ask you about, uh, I know that it was mentioned earlier when I wasn't here about the possibility of project labor agreements or the potential to allow for more, what we often refer to as uh, bid bundling. In other words, if we have to fix one handball court in my district or renovate one tennis court in my district, why can't we bundle several of those smaller capital projects into a larger capital project so that it's, we're not starting from scratch every time we need to renovate a handball court or a tennis court? I was told several years ago, prior to this administration and the previous administration, that the concern with that particular um, issue was that it would somehow disenfranchise MWBEs. And uh, that was a concern that was relayed to me in the Capital Division here at the Council, but we were very frustrated when we're, each Council member is trying to rebuild or fix uh, a skateboard park, a handball court, the tennis court, again, some of these smaller projects. Has parks gotten better with those type of uh, uh, 
capital projects and how do you handle them? Well, we do use bundling in certain cases. Uh, the PLA right now is under negotiation, so I'd prefer not to discuss the, the PLA. But I'll have the uh, Commissioner respond more about what has changed and what practice is different today than in the past. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. So we have uh, used bid bundling in the past, and we still continue to do it. But we've learned quite a bit about when it works and when it doesn't work. Um, clearly, what we've learned is that you should not bundle things when it crosses over boroughs, because individual contractors oftentimes then can't handle work in more than one borough at a time. So it, it can work when it's a very discrete project. It's a similar scope of work, and it's done within the same geographic area. Um, but again, when we've done it and it, we ha the work is done over a series of boroughs, we always find that someone is not going to be happy because one project is going to move forward in one borough, but someone else then is going to get a delayed project. So, so it's really a capacity issue in terms of vetting these potential contractors. It is a capacity issue, but we have never found that even for some of our larger contractors, when you bundle things across boroughs, that it works. That, that's fair enough. Uh, the second um, issue I want to bring up um, it relates to public-private partnerships. I really believe that uh, if the City of New York wants to achieve top quality uh, customer satisfaction or service, um, that city agencies deliver, that we need to do a much better job of engaging the private sector. Now, the Parks Department has gotten very good in Queens with teaming up with JetBlue and the Mets and some of the larger corporate folks, but I'm really looking at the neighborhood by neighborhood and block by block potential that I think is, is really untapped. If you look at sanitation, for instance, they have adopt a litter basket. A local pharmacy or a grocery store can adopt a basket. If you look at DOT, you have a local uh, catering hall may adopt a, a highway or, or an area mile. But when it comes to green streets, for instance, something as small and, and, and and, and mundane as a green street that, that is not being well taken care of because parks resources are spread so thin. Why don't we allow for public-private partnerships to adopt a green street or other opportunities to bring in private money and private enterprise or private companies to help us enhance green space in the city? Well, well Councilmember, thank you for the question. We actually do have a marketing team that does just that. We have adopt a park program, and we're also reaching out to the private sector, uh, whether it's uh, a number of them, I don't want to name them specifically, that actually will invest in basketball court refurbishment, skate parks refurbishment, and they're actually doing that on their own. And so we have a whole division that reaches out to the private sector, and I get a quarter report on what is the adopt a park program. I'm hoping this will get the word out, that we encourage more and more to come in. Uh, but as we see an opportunity, we'll solicit that company to see if they want to provide something in their park. We've been great with sports coding, skate parks, uh, across our city, and we welcome more of it. I, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm concerned again about the smaller neighborhood by neighborhood, block by block, green spaces. So like those little triangles or those green spaces, when we have a Kiwanis group or a fraternal organization or a civic organization that says, hey, we want, we have money, we want to hire a landscaper, we want to, we want, we want this to be maintained at a higher level, how do we engage that? Who do, who do I engage in your office? Who do I contact? The person right Great. here. Okay. Uh, and like I said, we welcome those opportunities. If you have people that are interested, I have let two us know. spots in particular, but yes. I, I'd love to continue the conversation offline yes. uh, with uh, the, the assistant commissioner. Uh, yes, Sam Biederman. Okay, Sam, and uh, maybe afterwards we can chit chat about this. But uh, I have some interesting ideas, and I'd love to see Parks uh, be a little bit more flexible, that's all. We love that. We'd love to talk to you, so I'll get you after the hearing. Thank you, sir. Commissioner, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Ulrich, and thank you again. I just had a couple of questions uh, before we get to um, our next panel for today's hearing. So there is a, an important connection between both capital and maintenance as it relates to staff. And as I mentioned earlier in this adopted budget in June, we were very successful in achieving almost 300 new parks staff. For many of us, that is an important part of not only just maintaining parks, but the presence of PEP officers. And you know, for us in Bronx County, we've got the opioid situation we're dealing with, so the needles um, that are so rampant in our parks is also very concerning. So adding those park gardeners, the PEP officers, has been tremendous. Um, so I wanted to ask in, in terms of 
the staff itself, do you feel that we have enough in terms of capacity of all of the capital projects to date that we have, and you know you'll get more um, in the next two budget cycles, what are we doing to make sure that we also have capacity in terms of the capital division itself and the staff, the designers, the architects, et cetera? Well, for any new land, we typically work with OMB to add staff if it's a new park. So most of the work that we do is improving an existing park. And so we are right. certainly grateful for both the mayor and council and the park advocates who advocated for more park staff. And so we have and right-sized uh, what those crews should be, uh, where the locations, where they're needed most, and we continue to work both with the advocates, our administrators, uh, to make sure that they're uh, adequately served. When we do add new parkland, that's when uh, we look at adding more staff, but through our existing park system, uh, we're very grateful for the additional staff, and we're doing our best just to make sure we keep up those inspection ratings. So are we also looking, and you said the majority of our park capital work is renovation of existing parkland. Correct. For the new capital parks that we have and new projects. So as an example, the Jerome neighborhood rezoning that we achieved two years ago, we have $60 million set aside for new parkland, $25 million for Grant Park, about four point six million for Corporal Fisher, which these are brand new build outs. Uh, Bridge Playground, we also have the Harlem River Greenway, the Esplanade along the Harlem River in the Bronx. So these are all major capital projects that obviously will fall into Park's portfolio. So what timeline and how often are you looking at brand new park projects when they come online and comparing that to the overall budget needs of that borough in terms of adding more staff. Right. Because I think, you know, just like we look at SCA and new schools, new housing, all of that interagency coordination is really important to make sure that everyone is having the same conversation as it relates to staff and capacity. So as, uh, thank you for the question, as the new parks come online, we do start those conversations with OMB about new needs, about now that we have X amount of acres coming online of new park, we look at some of those staffing levels to make sure that we can adequately serve all the parks as well as the new parks in the borough. So that happens in a new needs, and it usually is when we anticipate a park opening uh, so that we can go ahead and initiate that new need request. Okay, and I wanted to ask, we've talked a lot about the Public Design Commission. What role does the Public Design Commission play in each of our parks capital projects? Well, it's for all city design projects. We happen okay. to be the agency that provides the most work to PDC. Okay. Uh, they're required to sign off on the final design. Uh, depends on the size of the project. There's conceptual, there's preliminary, and then final design. So they get to ultimately approve what that design is going to be. Is there a minimum amount of the project, a minimum amount that they look at, or they look at all capital projects? Yeah, anything that's on public property. Okay. And it's not just parks, it's all agencies. All and what was stated is that because we meet early on some of our standard design, uh, prior to me getting here, only 20% got approved the first time. Now we're over 90%. So PDC has been a great partner. I think they understand our new design approach, and it's really saved us a lot of time. Okay, another partner is uh, Department of Design and Construction, DDC. Yes. Um, Parks often partners with DDC on some of the larger capital projects. How does that interagency coordination work and when do you decide or who decides if DDC takes a Parks project? Well, there was an old process and a new process. They handle about 5%, 4 to 5% of our portfolio. Now we identify it up front and we do front end planning. So DDC is at the table uh, as we start designing the process. Plus they could take advantage of design build, which can be a huge asset. Right. So in the past we would advance it and then we would hand it over to DDC. Now it's more coordinated at the front end. And as a result, we do expect a much more streamlined and expedited process. Mm -hmm. So exactly what types of park projects does DDC handle? Uh, they tend to be the larger engineering type projects, buildings, bridges. Oh. Uh, so they tend to be the larger ones. Example are Ocean Breeze, uh, okay. the, the Bronx River House. These are very large, uh, multi-million dollar uh, engineering architectural projects and bridges. So that tends to be their portfolio. 
Okay. Um, well, my final question, I have to go vote next, uh, next in the room, um, is when you look at the landscape of parks and a lot of this administration's priorities, we have had different programs like the Anchor Program for us in the Bronx, the St. Mary's Park. We've had the CPI, Community Partnership Initiative, and that's garnered a lot of new park renovations. So what I want to ask is moving forward, we have two years in this administration, and I want to look at other opportunities where we can bark on new initiatives. Um, I've not seen that level of priority and really attention given to recreation centers. I love recreation centers, um, and, and they need a lot. They have a lot of capital needs. Um, I represent the Mullally Recreation Center, which is right next to Yankee Stadium, and that capital is about $11 million from roof to ground, just in terms of the needs. So I guess what I'm asking and what I'm offering in the next you know, few weeks as we prepare for a new budget season, I would love to see the administration come out with an ambitious priority focused on parks recreation centers. Many of them are operated by local CBOs in conjunction with the parks department, and they operate the programs, and that's great. But when you look at the capital work, it's just enormous for our council budgets to absorb. And so I would love to see something happen where there can be a focus like the anchor program, like CPI, but let's look at something for our rec centers. Thank you for that recommendation. It's point well taken. And as you do know, we are investing in a number of our rec centers. Malali, that was a public-private yep. partnership, and we're looking to do more on other rec centers. But when we talked about that capital assessment, the rec center was part of that portfolio. So your recommendation is well taken, and is something we'll go back and have that conversation. Thank okay, you. great. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I'll turn it back over to our Chair Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Commissioner, let me ask you uh, one or two questions before uh, uh, we have to go to public participation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I want to ask you something about the design process uh, of capital project. How often is design work contracted out? On sites which includes no building, uh, that we do about 30% is outsourced uh, to outside designers. Mm. And for buildings, I believe it's about 60% is outsourced to outside designers. So that tends to be the breakdown for each. So sites is just playground, no buildings, and then one uh -huh. with the building, then at 60% of the time. So on average, how, how, how often that, uh, does the Public Design Commission reject designs that are submitted by uh, you guys? Well, on the first round, it's now under 10%. Uh. Before, it was 80%. So we're having great success with the Public Design Commission. We meet with them early, and that has been beneficial, and they understand our new design approach. So we applaud the Public Design Commission for working with us. Uh, when the design is rejected, does the PDC explain uh, their rationale? Yes, they are very clear oh. uh, on their rationale. And because we, as designers, you need clear design direction. Uh, we come back, uh, we see how we could accommodate it, and then we present it back to PDC for approval. Okay. So what is the current approval rate for initial project design submitted to the public? Uh, to the PDC? Initial is now 93%. Oh, oh. It's very okay, high. Yeah. That gets you an A. So how come there's so, so, so much difference? You said right now it's 10% rejection. Before it was 80%. Right. Yeah. Uh, so well, must, it was a different administration, a but we sat down early uh, to understand what were some of those concerns, and then we shared with them our new prototype for comfort stations, we wanted to get some early feedback. Each commission has different members and expertise. And once we got an understanding of what their expectation was, we made sure we provided design that met some of those concerns. Mm -hmm. But our staffs work very closely together, and we have a pretty good pulse about what they find uh, to be acceptable. And we avoided customized design, which sometimes could present a challenge. Okay, uh, lastly, I want to ask you something uh, on the NWBE. The, how, what kind of things are you doing to improve 
my NWB uh, contracts, especially among the uh, uh, women, Asian women and, uh, and African American uh, women. Well, I can share with you the MWBE in general. Uh, we applaud the mayor's uh, goal of 30%. We in the parks departments at 27%. And through working with the city, we have recruitment fairs. We're constantly reaching out on a regular basis to draw in more eligible contractors, minority business enterprises. And so from our point of view, uh, being the second rated agency at 27% of the 30%, we're inching toward and, and maintaining, moving toward the mayor's goal. And so this is something that we do on a regular basis. We'll have to get back to you specifically. I don't have the numbers on um, Asian or uh, specifically women-owned businesses, but we'll see if we can parse that number out for you. Council Member Rafael Salmanca. Thank you, uh, Chair Kalos. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner. Um, Commissioner, I um, just wanted to ask you a few questions about capital projects in my district. Uh, last year, you and I, it was extremely cold. We did the ribbon cutting. Um, first, I want to say thank you. My community has been very blessed with the amount of capital infrastructure that you've put in into my communities in terms of the amount of um, uh, playgrounds that we've redone as part of your CPI. Um, and I am truly thankful, and so is my community. Uh, but we have, we have two playgrounds in which we've done the ribbon cuttings. Uh, they've, been, they've been open in operation, but the comfort stations still have not been completed. Um, you have Lions Playground and you have Melrose, Melrose Playground. Um, I've been in direct contact with my, my commissioner, Iris Rodriguez. Uh, have a great working relationship with her. Um, but you know, I wanted to take this opportunity to ask, what's taking so long? It's two words, it's called Con Ed. Uh, and this is something that we can certainly follow up. Uh, I'll let the Deputy Commissioner go in more detail, but right now this is an issue directly, not just for your comfort stations, but for the others throughout the city as Con Edison. Um, we are working very closely. Uh, the, this administration has been very helpful. We actually have biweekly phone calls with Con Ed to go over the specific issues. Um, with those comfort stations. I'm sorry, Deputy Commissioner, but comfort stations, you know, they revolve about water, so I would think that you would talk about environmental protection. What, what is it that Con Ed is not providing well, for these comfort stations? To provide the electricity and the, the gas that comes in to heat, heat the building. All right, and, and so how long has this been going on with Con Ed, and why is this the first that I hear of it? Um, well, we've been working. We've been working very closely, as I said, with the administration. We have regular phone calls. I do not know. I'm going to ask staff if they can give me some detail on when we think we might be able to resolve this by. Council, we'll get back to you get specifically back to you. on that. And then, very quick question. Thank you. Why are you using gas uh, opposed to steam? We actually, um, when we can, on our new comfort stations, we're actually using electric. Um, electric uh, is actually turned out to be, considering the size of the comfort stations itself, it's actually more efficient and cheaper to use electric. So for our newer comfort stations right now, we're, we're moving towards electric. That has been something that we've uh, looked at for a long time. It's um, just che it's cheaper, it's more efficient. All right, I, I just want to put on the record, it's just taking too long. You know, if we're doing ribbon cuttings, uh, you know, these are beautiful parks. We should provide the community with a full package, a full park, you know, not comfort stations that are just sitting there, you know, with barricades around them while individuals are, you know, in the playgrounds. And, and then finally, um, two fiscal years ago, I was able to, with, through, through the help with the speaker, and also it was put in through the mayor's budget, capital budgets, uh, baseball lights for two uh, baseball fields in my district. A year went by after that funding was put in, and then I heard that there was going to be community input. I, I just don't understand why, after that money was allocated, a, um, the Parks Department would allow a year to go by for community input, and then now, you know, it, it's gonna, it, it would take, a project would take almost three years just to put lights in a baseball field. Um, what type of community input are you asking for? Like, what kind of lights they would like to see? Let me just clarify, because we did have a meeting a couple of years ago, is not every project warrants a public meeting. And this is one I'd have to concur. We'll double check with staff. We had one other meeting where we were doing something on a, a walkway, and 
you know, when there's nothing to ask the community, we can bypass the public meeting. So let me go back to speak to staff to see where we can correct that. But I do agree with you that having something that's a limited scope, whether it's just lights going up, does not necessarily warrant a public meeting, just a public notification to the community board. So that's something, thank you for bringing that to my attention. I will correct and clarify going forward. All right, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair, for letting me ask my questions. Thank you, Councilmember Bavin. You still have a question? <laughs> Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to thank uh, the commissioner for coming, and I want to acknowledge that we recently had a renaming of a park, the Sankofa Park, which is a park that's over the African Burial Ground Square uh, property in my district, and that has been renamed as Sankofa Park. We had a beautiful ceremony. Marty Mort did his usual grand uh, preparation and we thank you for that and for those of you who are listening we invite you to come to our ribbon cutting on this Friday we will have a ribbon cutting uh, celebrating the reopening of what the Parks Department calls Linden Park but what we call Sunny Carson Park we want to invite you to that as well as to the reopening of the Cypress Hills Cypress Houses Park so I'm very pleased and I want to commend you and thank you for all of the uh, work that has been going on in the parks and look forward to a few other projects that should be coming uh, into the timetable to be completed within the next year or two. The question that I do have is the park, I'm not sure if it's called Betts Creek. It's, uh, I think we spoke about it once before. It was park land that had been given over to sanitation and it was through a, a lawsuit determined that it had to be returned to the city. And it's a very extensive kind of reclamation that has to go on. I understand that the Army Corps of Engineers is a major player in redesigning this park area. And my question is, how can we get some movement on this so that we can uh, have a beautiful open area to the public that can be accessible? Yes, I'm just checking in which park specifically. I understand it's in design. We'll make sure we get back to you on what is the timeline for that project to move forward. Okay, I appreciate that. And again, thank you for all the great work that you're doing in the East New York section of Brooklyn. We do appreciate it. Thank you. Just to remind everyone when the time is running out, so please ask short questions. <laughs> See you in control. It seems like a lot of folks have been talking about the comfort stations. There's been a lot of press coverage around the comfort stations. During your, uh, and, and this is a question that was submitted by uh, Yoav Gonan from the city. Uh, in your testimony, you mentioned that you have a new idea, a new plan. Uh, you're talking about doing bathrooms instead of comfort stations. In my limited experiences, all the comfort stations in my district are literally a men's room, women's room. They're still labeled that way. They're doesn't appear to be non-gendered bathrooms, and there's usually a closet, and that's about it. So I'm curious what you're, what you're looking for and what the differences would be and what kind of cost savings and time savings we could appreciate. Well, it is, uh, first we get over 100 million visitors to our parks every year, and we build all of our projects that is resilient and strong. It is not just a men's room and a women's room. Uh, it also has a facility uh, for park maintenance, that's part of it as well, as well as all the infrastructure to serve the comfort stations. Going forward, we are looking, again, we're not, we're not gonna put them in until we get some comfort working with the Department of Buildings and other entities to test out just a single unit uh, bathroom. Uh, so this is something we're gonna explore to get to a lot of parks that Councilmember Gibson talked about. It may not be a full station, but it could be uh, used by multiple genders, but just a one stall unit. We're trying to figure out what's the more inexpensive way to do it. The, the bathrooms I have in my district only have no, I mean, one this is or just two one stalls. Unit. No, I'm just saying just one unit itself. I got it. Uh, so we're trying to see what makes sense for each play state, playground. Uh, and like I said, that work is underway. We're trying to explore everything because we too are concerned about the cost of comfort stations. Uh, with regards to public-private partnerships, I think I've done a couple, got a couple under my belt to the tune of I think $15 million just from one of them to redo uh, four or five blocks. 
one of the concerns I have is just as we do those partnerships, how do we ensure that the funding that is provided is maintained? In my district, uh, New York Presbyterian set aside $1.5 million in 1989 to create a trust and a guaranteed uh, throughput of $32,000 a year. Uh, in today's dollars, or sorry, uh, if, if that trust still exists and it was properly invested and maintained at 7% interest, that trust is now worth $68 million and it is earmarked to provide care and maintenance for the East River Esplanade. Uh, been asking this for a couple of years, but do you know what the status of that trust is? Council Member, this is the first time I'm hearing about that trust, but I'll certainly circle back to find out more information. That is a lot of money, and if it can be used to maintain the East River Esplanade, we'll certainly find out more about it. Uh, and then uh, the thing I'd like to touch base on is, so before I move along to focusing just on construction, so we've established that it can take 12 months just to get something assigned. Uh, once it's funded for fully funded, that you do have 50 vacancies in the capital construction division. Uh, as a follow-up, uh, I don't see jobs that relate to capital construction in sufficient number or quantity or what have you on your site. Will you post all of them by tomorrow? Send me the links and I will blast it out to all my list. These are high quality, good paying jobs with benefits. Uh, so will those be updated and will those be sent to my office as well as all the committee chairs here? We will follow up with you, yes. Okay, and then will you commit to staffing up those 50 positions before you outsource another design contract? It is our desire is that we always are doing outreach. We even have fairs that we're outreaching. It's not because we don't want to fill them. We are in a competitive job market and we want to attract them to park. So it's not as if there are 50 vacancies that we're okay. Uh, there's always people coming and going and it's our goal to make sure all those positions are filled. With regard to construction, if we can pull up slide 13. Slide 13. Uh, when you get to slide 13, it will say at the end, inspection and closeout. And that is a period of two months, which seems long to a year. Can we get an understanding of why it would, I see members of the audience who are also wondering about that year. Uh, how do we get the closeouts down to something reasonable instead of it actually taking 12 months? Um, there, are, there are a couple of things. Once we hold that substantial completion use inspection, that first bullet there, the project is actually opened to the public then. So as far as the public is concerned, that portion of, of the construction, the, the project is open to the public. The year in there is because we do require a one-year guarantee period in there where the contractor is responsible to guarantee the workmanship of that project. So perhaps it doesn't belong on a timeline so much as just being a 12-month 12, 12 warranty. Correct. Okay. Uh, in terms of the construction, uh, I was sharing this when we started, but in terms of constituents literally putting up signs on top of your signs saying, call the council member, here's his phone number, here's his email address, this project is taking too long and I don't see construction happening. So during the 12 to 18 months, I think what frustrates my constituency and residents or anyone is seeing a piece of the city closed off uh, and not seeing any construction workers on the site. So I guess um, one question is, are there any seasonal limitations to construction and when it can happen? There are seasonal limitations, uh, weather being the biggest factor, uh, clearly torrential rain, high winds, but also cold weather when the ground becomes extremely hard and you cannot pour concrete. There's certain things you cannot do. And so our, as you start to move into December on into March, it becomes a very difficult period for construction. And yeah. also, a lot of our contractors are running multiple jobs, and so they may have a crew on one site one day, move them to another site another day, but our resident engineers do make sure that work is progressing. But as you can see from our completion, we exceed the target in terms of on time, on budget. I, I would love to see that in my district, I guess, two pieces. One, can we start saying to the contractors that they have to do an exclusive contract with us or that they can't split their teams between multiple parks projects. They show up, they keep working on our site until the job gets done. It's not our job to make their business more profitable. 
Uh, and the good news is it's the city of New York. I'm hoping that we have enough contractors where we could have multiple people working. So if there's one company and they say, well, it's gonna take us 12 months because we have two projects and we're due six months at each project, we could just say, how about you do six months here and we'll hire somebody else to do that same yeah. project But also instead. the other factor is a lot of our general contractors work with subcontractors and so it's not just their team. Mm -hmm. Very often they sub a lot of the work out. We do have a resident engineer, so the fact that someone is not on that job that day could be a matter of a subcontractor. They're focused on completing something on another side. But, but, that, but, I'm, the that. but I'm the client. So like, y y have any of you on this panel ever had work done in your house? Nope. Yes. We all have. Y and so y the, have you ever had like that contractor who shows up, does the demo, and then shows up three months later and then finishes the project in a day or two? Like, I think that's the, or what, what, has your been ex what have been your experiences when you've done work in well, your homes? Or, in or? my home, it depends on what the work is, but I have to be very clear, all of our projects are done on time, and I understand that people are looking to see, they come at different times, uh, but all the work is done basically on time. It is seasonal, weather dependent, ordering certain material that didn't arrive yet. There are a lot of different factors, but all of our projects are done. If it's 12 months, it's either 12 months or less. If it's 18 months, it's 18 months or less. And we do have wrench and engineers to go check the records to ensure projects are moving forward. So what's happening at the uh, mayor's, behind the mayor's mansion at 88th Street? It's been, it's been more that than 18 one, months. Partial of it is open right now. And if there was an issue, I want to get in too much detail, but there was one of the design firms that the, both everyone in the city had to cease doing business with. We had to take that design in-house. Sure. So, so I, I guess- Part of it is now open for the public. In terms of it, if there's a seasonal issue, uh, you've done a lot of projects in my district in phases. Could the Parks Department or reorient your projects towards doing certain types of work during certain seasons and splitting up the contract so that somebody comes in and does the, the warm weather work and then uh, once the concrete's poured and the fasteners are there, you have a different contract who does puts in the equipment in the, in the cold weather and then that way you can get around it because I, I can tell you, I'm looking around at all the developments going up around our city and somehow the Real Estate Board of New York and their folks and their buildings, they can put up a skyscraper faster than we can finish a park. And, and, and that's, right. a, that's a problem to me and they're able to do it when it's freezing out. I've heard that. I'm in downtown Brooklyn where there's construction going on constantly. I haven't found that to be the case, that they're taking many years to complete projects. Uh, but just to emphasize the point, um, it is seasonal and we're continuing to meet our targets and it's something that we're committed to doing uh, across the board. But I do hear that very often, and I'm watching several construction projects, and we've now completed many projects while they haven't even topped off their skyscraper. In terms of timeline, you, you, you're focusing on the words on time. I guess the issue is, can we get closer to how long does the actual work take? How many man, out, man or woman hours are we actually talking about? And instead of just saying it's either 12 months or 18 months, actually just saying, okay, this is how many hundred hours it's gonna take or a thousand hours, and let's just actually have realistic goals adjusted and set to the actual project and force the people who are bidding to say, you know what, I'm gonna actually do it and I'm not gonna try to shuffle people between jobs. Thank you for the question. We can get back to our contracting team to find out what legally we can and cannot do. We tend to give them a duration period of time. It is there to their benefit to finish projects sooner. Uh, most do, uh, and that's the relationship we currently have with our contracting community. Is there an incentive that you created be so that a, a because you stated it, and it fairly honest and transparently, a contractor currently tries to do as many jobs as possible at the same time, right. and so it's to their benefit to get as many jobs and then do as many and juggle as many jobs. How do we create an incentive for them to take one job, get it done quickly, and then get another job? Right. Uh, I'll let Commissioner answer one part of it, but we do monitor when a uh, contractor bids on a project. We look their track record and how many they can handle. There are some that have teams on all the jobs. There are some that bring their expertise from one to the other, but there's constantly work going on. And so because we have a limited pool, we have to work with the contract community we have. I'll let Commissioner respond to uh, the incentives. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Kalos. Yeah. Just uh, uh, yeah, in closing. Short. Yeah. 
Um, we are looking into whether or not we can do a cash incentive bonus in order to finish projects early. Um, it's something we're exploring uh, with the administration, but in particular with OMB, because the question will become who pays that early incentive bonus. So if it's a council-funded project, who funds that, that extra cash, to the, that incentive to get them to finish early? But we're exploring it. Thank you. Now, uh, we have to move uh, to, into public testimony. And since we are running out of time, we have to take a recess of five minutes and move the public uh, uh, participation next door. Yeah, next door. Yep, yeah. to the room. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, can you pick your right up? Quick?